Would you open your Bibles, please, to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, chapter 1, and we are looking at verse 18 this morning uh, and onwards to the end of the chapter. 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, I don't know if you know much about liberalism, what theological liberalism was, but liberalism is something that came out after the Enlightenment period those in the modernistic era, those who were uh, saying that uh, the scientific age that we are in says that you cannot trust the words as they are meant and intended in the scriptures. They must mean something else because we dare not believe in something that we cannot test. That is miracles. We dare not say something that other people find repulsive, and that is the doctrine of sin. And so what we find in liberalism is pastors and scholars who were preaching something that they said was meant in scripture that was never intended, that was not part of the meaning of words or the reality of the text. 19th century liberal pastor Henry Ward Beecher, if you know that name, he was the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, and actually the Beecher family lived in this Cincinnati area. 19th century liberal pastor Henry Ward Beecher once said this, he said, the old forms of Christianity over the last 1800 years have not advanced humanity, and so why should we care for it? It is of no value when we look at the result. In other words, we don't want to believe the Bible like others did for 1800 years. To liberals like Beecher, Christianity was no more than a set of moral principles for living a good life and their idea for what would better society. That's what they were about. Now, shortly after Henry Ward Beecher came one of the most notable and in fact noble voices in the fight against liberalism, and that was J. Gresham Machen. How many of you have heard, heard of J. Gresham Machen? There's quite a number of you. He actually founded the Westminster Theological Seminary. Machen uh, believed that words are important. Meaning in the text of scripture is important. The logic of the meaning is important, even if you don't like where it leads to. And authority of God's word is important. And so if you thought that those concepts were not going to be good to help you grow a church because people didn't like it, then you were missing the essence of what Christian mission and Christian teaching is. So in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, J. Gresham Machen wrote this, the type of religion which rejoices in pious sounds of traditional phrases regardless of their meanings or shrinks from controversial matters will never stand amid the shocks of life. In the sphere of religion, as in other spheres, the things about which men are agreed are apt to be the things that are least worth holding. The really important things are the things about which men will, listen to this word, fight. Fight. Do you ever put that word with your Christian faith, fight? Do you ever think about that word, fight? He's saying this. If you lose the logic of the meaning and authority of the text of scriptures, you end up losing the saving reality of the gospel. There is only one true saving gospel and only one way of salvation. If you want to agree on Jesus' moral goodness, but not on his bodily resurrection or sin because they're repulsive ideas that you can't possibly perpetuate in a, in a scientific age, then Machen says that's worth a fight. That's worth a fight. We should fight. Because when you lose inspiration of the scriptures, when you lose miracles from the Bible, you lose the gospel because the resurrection is a miracle, the virgin birth is a miracle, the authority of scripture, the inspiration of scripture is a miracle. And listen, you lose everything. You lose everything. So J. Gresham Mason then made the point in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, which everybody should read. I say that every Sunday about a book, don't I? Okay, so anyway, this is one of them, uh, Christianity and liberalism. He actually says in the loss of the God's gospel, liberalism is a religion, but it's not Christianity. It's not Christianity. Now, we still have liberalism, brothers and sisters, around us today, everywhere. Um, it's morphed. It's morphed beyond the general morality of its early, earlier fathers. In fact, a long way past that. 
Uh, we also live in a time where we could write, by the way, a whole list of attacks against the integrity of the Bible, couldn't we? Even those that, that have come from within the so-called church. Let me mention a few to you. The Word of Faith movement, the New Apostolic Reformation, Christian nationalism, cultural Christianity, social gospel, Hebrew roots, liberation theology. And I could go on with terms like this that so many of you, many of you may not even really know what those terms mean or how dangerous they are to the gospel. And I actually think when we go to Norwood, we should do a Sunday school series, just giving an overview of each of those attacks against the gospel that are, that are within our church today. Uh, we're in a fight. And I don't know if you feel it. In fact, I think the fight is often described in the wrong way, but we are in a fight, but it needs to be a good fight. And it needs to be fought well. So the question from our text with Paul writing to Timothy this morning, I think is, is how can Christians be encouraged to have the right approach to the spiritual battle, the spiritual war that we are in? And let me suggest to you that that I think this is the answer, that we obediently fight the good fight when gospel integrity is our very life, is our life. Now, I want to prove this thesis today from 1 Timothy 1, verses 18 to 20. Open with me. Let me read it to you. And just listen to Paul's words. Just listen to what he says to Timothy. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their life, among whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, what do we know so far before we come to these verses? Well, there seems to be rather stiff competition to the integrity of the gospel in Ephesus, don't there? There's some, doesn't there? There's, there's some people within the Ephesus church who are proposing other doctrines that take you away from the integrity of the gospel. And so at various times throughout these letters, you're going to hear Paul really encouraging his spiritual son. And he's called Timothy, my son, now two times. Timothy is going to be urged to remain in Ephesus, as we've already seen, to do everything he can to keep this church in sound doctrine and specifically in the integrity of the gospel. And to do that, he's already found this. If you think you're ill-equipped for this, Timothy, it's not about your power. It's about the mercy and grace of God. Didn't we hear that last week? It's God's mercy and grace. It's God's work. It is not your work. It is not your power. It's God's. But once we understand a concept like that, that it is the mercy and grace of God and God's power and not ours, we tend to easily step in a wrong direction. We tend to say, okay, well, if God's got it under control, let go and let God. Have you heard that statement before? Let go and let God, one of the worst statements that has ever been in the Christian church. Please get rid of it. It's horrible because that is not the case at all. We step out in confidence of God's power. We obediently go out with the gospel ministry in God's power. There is this, there is a, uh, something we need to know that we actually actually have to step out in battle. We actually have to step out in battle. It's not let go and let God. It's rely on God's power alone as you serve him in obedience in the gospel. So we, we, we kind of want to ask, what are Timothy's responsibility in the way that he approaches that battle before him? What does Timothy do? We always want to ask that question, don't we? And so I, I think Paul is starting with just simple obedience. Timothy, be obedient to God's call on your life. Be obedient to God's call on your life. Look at verse 18 again. This charge or command you might have in your translations. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Now, the first thing I think we need to see in here, you see battle language, don't you? Do you see battle language in here? The warfare. It's a war. The fight, the good fight. Wage the good warfare. This is a fight. There's battle language. There's a command, isn't there? There's a charge. But I also want you to see 
Please look carefully. There's the sincerity of a spiritual father. You ever seen those movies where new recruits, new Marines are coming in, they're getting off the bus and the sergeants are outside of the bus waiting for them. And they're yelling all sorts of horrible language at them and calling them little worms and you're not worth anything and get in line and give me 10, right? That's not the language we get from Paul. It is battle language, but Paul's a spiritual father. And, and, and look at this. It, it, there's strength in the command, but there's sincerity of love, isn't there, from Paul? He starts with the command or charge entrusted to Timothy. Look at these words. Don't just step over them. His child. My child. What Marine sergeant did you ever hear saying that? My child. See, we, we're going to see Paul giving commands a, a number of times in First and Second Timothy. But he never stops being a spiritual father. Even as an apostle, you know, he could say, I'm an apostle and I can give you commands and, 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 and you better listen to me. No, Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't even command on the basis of his own authority. Each time you see Paul commanding, it's on the basis of something that he knows is much greater than himself. And it's with the sincerity of a father. It's a command on something greater and it acts as an encouragement for Timothy to, to, to take that first step in the battle as his son. That's what we get today. So... I want to bring that out because, you know, when we see battle language and we see battle language a few times in the, in particularly in the New Testament and in Paul's language, I really want us to be careful, brothers and sisters. Way too often I hear Christians use this as an excuse for their angry rhetoric, their sinful anger, their forceful actions, their Facebook posts in the church and in the world. It is not, it is not there for you to imitate rudeness and anger that is sinful, but you'll see today that there is other language within these verses that are almost, they almost act like the Geneva Convention in a battle, right? Because there's the, they're the rules of engagement. When, when Paul gives this command to Timothy, his child, we are not meant to look over these, these little words, my child. We're meant to say, why is he giving battle language to his child, to someone that's so dear? Why is he putting this this sincerity in it. it, some of us might even think that weakens the command. But listen to what Paul once said about Timothy in, in the Philippian, uh, to the, his letters to the Philippian church. In Philippians 2, 19 to 21, just listen to this. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will genuinely, be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he served with me in the gospel. So Timothy is commanded by Paul as a spiritual father because, look at why, because Timothy has a pastoral heart. It's not because he's an angry, strong man. It's because he loves Christ and the saints. It's because he is going to be genuinely cared about the, uh, the welfare of others as he serves Christ. And that's not a weakness. That's not a weakness in battle. That's the strength. It's who Christians are in the battle. So don't look over those beautiful little words to only see the language of war. Now let's move on. Because don't miss the strength of the command from Paul to Timothy and what it's based on. It's, look at verse 18, it's in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you. Hmm. Prophecies. Prophecies about Timothy. Prophecies that were specifically made about Timothy. Does that kind of trip you up a little bit? It, you know, when I first read over this, it, it kind of trips me up a little bit until I think it through. No doubt you've got questions about it. So we need to probably answer some of those questions. What prophecies are we talking about, you know? Because they're, they're specific to Timothy. And I think we get some of those answers in a couple of other verses about Timothy that we find actually in these letters. Would you please turn, just uh, flip over a few pages to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just have a look at verse 14 here. 1 Timothy 4, 14. And let me read that to you. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. 
practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. So there's this sense, isn't there, in which we don't know what fully happened there, but there was this prophecy, it was about Timothy, and it had something to do with his gift, didn't it? Because it, it's, it's there in the text. Don't, don't, don't neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy. He, he was set apart for whatever he was set apart for by the elders laying on hands on him and there being a prophecy about him. Now, we don't know exactly when that happened. It's really hard to see. I wonder, did it happen right at the beginning, right back at Lystra? Because you get in Acts that when Paul first met Timothy, these people came and gave him good reports about Timothy. He's, he's this great guy. And we see something in him. In fact, in fact, we, we want you to know, we, we, we think that he's set aside for something, for, for possibly pastoral ministry. And perhaps they laid their hands on him and, and set him apart for being trained with Paul through missionary journeys so that he would be a pastor in a church and, and doing that. Or perhaps even it was a lot closer than that. Maybe it was even in Ephesus. He'd been there. He'd been with Paul. He'd been working in the church with Paul. Paul was going. And so maybe it was the elders of that church had seen the gifting in him and set him apart for ministry. But in the very next verse, we find out exactly what that, that gift is. In verse 16 of 1 Timothy 4, we see Paul saying to Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching on the teaching persist in this for so by so doing you will have strength both your you will save both yourself and your hearers and so it's a teaching ministry that is for the hearers and that is in the Ephesus church and he's there in a teaching admonishing I believe shepherding capacity a pastoral capacity now one other verse in in Timothy's letters in Paul's letters to Timothy shows I believe that this prophetic call however it happened on Timothy's life was going to be an intimidating task. Look at 2 Timothy, just flip over a couple more pages to chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. And look at what else Paul says. He says this, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, either separately or Paul was with the elders doing that. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. See, I, th I think Paul is saying, Timothy, step out. Use what God has called you to by prophetic ministry and the laying on of hands, including my hands. Do what he has called you to through that prophetic calling and don't be intimidated by the difficult circumstances, which look so difficult, look incomprehensible, right? And, and unconquerable, but remember who this calling is ultimately from. It was given to you by prophetic call. It's not just by these people. They've given it to you from God. So use it in a spirit of power and love and self-control. So it seems as, as we're looking here that, that this is the sense of prophecies previously made about Tim Timothy that accord with the command that Paul is giving. It's these prophecies. I'm commanding you based on this. Now, I potentially hear you asking something else, right? What is this to do with any of us? Timothy is being given this specific command, these specific prophecies about him, but we don't walk around today seeing anybody in our church saying that they're a prophet and prophesying specifically about us so that we know exactly what we need to do. Are you with me on that question? Yes, you are. No doubt. Um, firstly, I, I, I want to put this to us. I do think, and I, and I think this because I believe we get a good picture of this, particularly in the book of Acts and also in 1 Corinthians, but I do think that surrounding the apostolic ministry of establishing the church, there was a gift, there was a function of a prophet in the church. I think surrounding the apostolic ministry of establishing the church in the early church, a spirit directed help to organize the practical ministry of the church. All of the doctrine in the gospel surrounding the gospel came through the apostles, but that had to be worked out in specific ways in the church. And the prophetic ministry was the practical application, the practical working of that. And I think that's what we find in that prophetic ministry. And so Timothy is being set aside to be trained by Paul and deal with this difficulty that's in Ephesus. Now, some 
may agree with this from me, uh, but I would also say this, that it seems to me that this function in the church is actually gone with the apostles. I don't believe it is around anymore. And I think we have the effect, just like the, the effect of the apostles ministry, I think we have the effect of that ministry in the, the scriptures today that we have. And so I want to deal with that just for a little bit, because I think what is in effect in Timothy in that prophecy is made clear to us by it's an account in these letters that we're actually writing that are for us as well. Now, for example, Timothy was identified by prophetic ministry to preach and protect doctrine given by the apostles. Let's take one of those things that he was, he was, uh, he was set apart to do, to do that for. Let's, um, let's take, for instance, church leadership. So he was preaching about and protecting the doctrine of the apostles on the basis of talking about what right church leadership is, particularly eldership. We get that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now we have these verses. You and I have these verses in scripture, don't we? They show us what happened and so now there may be a man among us and there has been we've got four elders here men among us who desire to be elders and we are able to identify those men with authenticity because because of that prophetic ministry and the apostolic ministry we see very clearly qualifications that need to go with those men who are called to be elders who have a desire to be elders. So we have, by the word of God, what was through the apostles and prophets uh, in the beginning. We don't need a special prophecy about someone among us because we are able to see the desire and the qualifications among us because of the prophecy and the apostolic doctrine that was in the early church that we have in the scriptures. So uh, Timothy was prophetically called to engage in that and in fact not just to talk about elders but to talk about the calling on the whole church timothy prophetically called to this ministry and the upholding of the apostolic doctrine told this whole church that we need to be uh, those who uphold the integrity of the gospel because timothy later on in the text you'll see calls the whole church to be the pillar and buttress of truth that's to the whole church. We have that in the scriptures. That's a calling to us that we now have in the scriptures. So I, I just want to say this. Don't underestimate what we have in abundance in a full canon of the scripture, what they had in prophetic and apostolic ministry in the establishment of the church. Don't underestimate what we have in their full canon of the scripture that we have. Isn't it glorious that we have that? No Christian in this room can say that they are not called into the spiritual war because we have the text of scripture that calls us into that war. Now, on the basis of that calling, the prophetic calling on Timothy's life, the word of God calling for us, Timothy was to actually step out into the battle and wage the good warfare, fight the good fight. Now, Paul is commanding Timothy on the basis of those prophecies, which is the call of God on Timothy's life through that prophetic ministry of the church. The implication here that we get, I believe, in this verse is, Timothy, the step, the first step that you take into battle, the thing that makes your, step, your foot just take its first step into battle is this. It's the obedience of the command of God in your life. It's the obedience to the command of God in your life. God is commanding you to the integrity of the gospel in this church obey that the calling of god that we are to obey now you might say okay still timothy was called to a pastoral role right and i believe that elders pastors are called to a special role in leading the church in the protection of the integrity of the gospel in the truth of the scriptures that's true but I also want to say this, brothers and sisters, that as you read through the New Testament, the elders are never protecting the gospel integrity alone. They're always called to lead the whole church in protecting the integrity of the gospel and the truth of the whole word of God. So we're all responsible to obey God's command in this, aren't we? Aren't we? Do you sense that call today? Because you get it from the scriptures. We are all called to obey God's command 
in our life to uphold the, the, the truth of his word, the integrity of his gospel. And that's getting us to take that first a step in, in obedience. But how does it work out? Well, uh, we, we see next that we fight the good fight when God's truth is actually alive in our life. So we step out with God's truth being a living word in our life. Now, I want to suggest to you, even though there are problems in Ephesus with the teaching of false doctrines, false ideas, ideologies that undermine the gospel, this is not just a war, war of words and ideologies. Words have meaning. They compel actions, don't they? Ideas compel actions. False words have drastic consequences. True words have real power. And that's the importance of the integrity of the gospel, because when we add to the gospel, when we take away from the gospel, it's no longer the gospel. It's no longer the one true saving gospel. And so we need to understand how important this is. This is about the mission and glory of God in the world. This is important stuff. This is a good fight. This is a good fight. There's plenty of bad fights. I want to tell Christians, stop, you're in a bad fight. Get out of that fight. This is a good fight. And it's to be fought in a good way. And that's why when Paul says we are to wage the good warfare, he then look at verse 19, the end of verse 19, he then goes on to say, holding faith and a good conscience. Do you see those words? Holding faith and a good conscience. I think what Paul is saying here when he says holding faith, he's not just telling Timothy, be strong, believing in Jesus, it's your faith. I think it's a whole encompassing, it's your faith in the faith. It's your faith in, in all of the truth of the scriptures and the apostolic witness that centers in the gospel that you are upholding and protecting. That's the faith. Your, you hold faith in the fight against false doctrine by holding to the objective propositional body of truth that we have that specifically focuses on the integrity of the gospel. Now, let me give you an example where that's happened. Many, many, many examples in church history, but the one that you'll all know so well is the, the 16th century Reformation and ongoing. The Reformation was, was a huge example of this, brothers and sisters, when the Roman Catholic tradition was undermining the integrity of the gospel. And so the, the reformers were calling the church back to the authority of the word of God from Genesis all the way through to Revelation calling us back to the truth of the word of God because the integrity of the gospel had been undermined. And so out of the Reformation, we got those statements that we know are the five solas, the five alone statements. You know what I'm talking about, right? Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Sola Christus, and Sola Dia Gloria. What are they? That through the objective propositional truth in the scriptures alone. We find that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, to God's glory alone. We hold that faith, that, that it centers in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God. We hold that truth that shows us that from the very first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation, this is a truth that corrects every other truth claim around in, in this world. It teaches us who we're accountable to, doesn't it? To God, the creator, the, the wonderful God of the universe. It teaches us actually the definition of a human, who humans are, what the actual problem the greatest problem for every human is it's our sinful nature and our sin committed against the God of the universe. It teaches us God's eternal judgment upon sin and upon humans that have committed it on that sin. And, and in teaches us the only way of salvation to reconciliation with God is through Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose from the dead. It teaches us God's, the, the, the reality of that salvation in our life and it teaches us the future hope and glory of that beautiful salvation. You see, all we have that we must hold fast from the objective propositional body of truth that is in the whole of the scriptures. We fight the good fight by holding that faith. It contradicts the psychologists of this world, who, by the way, don't understand what a human is. 
and they don't understand what human problems are. And they try to group them together in common groups that they call disorders and medicate them and whatever else that they do. It, it, it contradicts the, the, the philosophers of this world who attempt to find meaning in the universe by their own human autonomous reasoning that, that comes from a speck on a planet that can't even be seen from the end of our galaxy. We can't know everything. It, it teaches us so much. It stands against the myths and endless genealogies and useless speculations from men and women in Timothy's day, and it corrects the doctrine of those in the church that stray and attempt to bring others into their error, whether it be the Pentecostal word of faith movement or simply the watering down of the gospel in a seeker church. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The word of Christ. Now, it's really important that we hold to the objective propositional body of truth in the scriptures that give us the integrity of the gospel. But I also want to say this. It's not just a fight about dogma and ideologies and words it's a fight of life it's a fight of life paul tells timothy we fight the good fight by holding faith and look at this and good conscience do you see that and good conscience now what does that mean but that truth is evident in our actual life you can't believe something before god and not live it and have a good conscience right? You can't, you've got to, to stand in good conscience before God, believing his truth is living his truth, is believing it in our life and living it out. There's a subjective reality to the objective truth, the objective and the subjective, how it, how it plays in our own life actually go together, don't they? They always go together. And so, you know, there's this subjective reality to the objective truth of God that has authenticity in our life. We don't just know it, we live it. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the talk, don't we? Now, some of you were there the day that I was ordained uh, to be a pastor and particularly of this church over five years ago. Seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it, Sue? Anyway, um, you know, we had three pastors get up and, and give me some words of commendation you know of of encouragement and I rem I'll never forget I can't remember his exact words but I know the sentiment I know what he was saying I'll never forget my dear friend Brad Bigney he got up he gave this public encouragement to me uh, Brad basically said that as we come into this pastoral ministry we're continually cor correcting doctrine correcting teaching and we're teaching truth but we must understand that this correction must find its way to correcting lives. The correcting of truth must find its way to correcting lives. The church can't, must not just be a seminary. Every problem of sexual immorality, of greed, of marital conflict, every situation of disunity and division in the church Every debilitating anxiety and depression are associated with someone either not holding the truth of scripture, not understanding the truth of scripture, or not applying the truth or knowing how to apply the truth of scripture to their life, or both. Pastoral ministry is both holding the truth and living the truth so that you might get into the trenches of battle with people in their sins so that you might also help them to hold and live the healing truth of the word of God in their life. It's really, really important. And I would say that's exactly what all of us need to be with each other. I hope you hear that. We, we need that ministry with each other, not, not bringing our own ideas and living our own ways, but bringing God's truth lived out in our own life as we help each other do the same. That's faith and good conscience. Faith and good conscience. Now, that's a repeat of words. We've heard the words faith and good conscience before in Paul to Timothy, and we're going to hear them again in these letters as well, because they're a theme of the letters. Paul is consistently calling Timothy in ministry to sound doctrine and its authenticity in his life in the church. And so this is a call to us, sound doctrine and its authenticity in our lives. 
It's why Paul so often in his letters talks about conscience because conscience is a very, very important thing. Conscience is, he uses it as an appeal. Let me, let me give you an example. Romans chapter nine, verse one. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. In, in, in other words, I'm committed to the truth and I stand before you in appeal for what I believe and actually live in my life. I stand before you in good conscience because it's not just words, it's the, the way I live, it's, it's how I believe, it's the truth of those words in my life. Now, I would say that's a pretty effective way to fight. What do you reckon? You don't just fight with words, you fight with actions and actions that back up the words you say. And, it's, and, and that's the integrity of the gospel in this. Now, some people sadly don't see it that way. And so we move on to the last part of 19 and into verse 20, lastly. The good fight actually is for the sake of those who oppose it. Look at verse 19, the end of verse 19 onwards. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, this is where Paul's words actually also have that sting to them but it has the sting of compassion and sadness so there are some particularly Hymenaeus and Alexander that's not the last that we're going to hear of those two men by the way in these letters this is amazing because what Paul says about them here we still see them in the church throughout these letters in these next two in these next letters that we're going to have in first and second Timothy but uh their lives are made like shipwrecks. That's, that's the, the heart-wrenching wording that Paul uses. Their lives, you're supposed to see a picture in that. You're supposed to think about a ship dashed to pieces on rocks and sunk to the bottom of the ocean. That's pretty drastic. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty sorrowful. And so they're that way because of the false doctrines applied to their lives that have caused them to live in blasphemy against God. We know it's blasphemy because look at the end of verse 20. He says, this is happening to them so that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's a description of what their lives have become. They are lives that reject God's truth. They live out their own ideas and lies. And at the end of the day, they call God a liar by what they believe and what they do. That's heartbreaking. You can hear the sorrowful words dripping from Paul's lips. And Paul has to declare something that is really in your face. It's really in our face as we read it. It, it just seems, whoa. It, it, it's, it's something that I want to say is the reality anytime that we have to go through with church discipline. And the reality is in this sin-cursed world, that is going to happen to us, right? And so he hands them over to Satan. And I think what Paul is saying here is that they're no longer under the protection of the church. They're no longer to considered to be one among us under the, concept, the protection of the church and the protection of Christ in the church. They are, they are not named among us. They're handed over to the worldliness, to the God of worldliness. Who's that? Satan, right? The little G God of this world. They're handed over there. And so the, the, the hope there is, is that when, if you are truly a believer, and you're living outside of the protection of Christ in the church, and you're out in the world and under the, under the torment of Satan, you can't be there forever. It leads you to repentance, and you want to come back home. That's, Paul, that's what Paul wants. Look at what he says. Because so often, when we hear about this, we hear about the angry, self-righteous dogmatism of people pointing the fingers of others and saying, get out, you're not part of us. But listen to what Paul says. He says, they're handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. In other words, you're going to be in this situation because we want you to know what the reality of this way is. The, the, the way of the transgressor is hard. And so we want you to see what the way of blasphemy against God is, that you might repent and return to us, that you might learn not to blaspheme God. So the hope for Paul is, and the hope if we ever do this, it's, it's an experience of, of hardship where those who cannot be named among us might even repent and return. 
Our desire is that the Hymenaeuses and the Alexanders in the church, and specifically any that might come in our church, would return to holding faith and good conscience with us. That's what it is. And we must fight, brothers and sisters, this good fight the right way to protect the gospel at all costs. Why? Because there is only one true saving gospel. You lose that, you lose everything. So we're going to pray for each other, aren't we? We're going to pray for your brothers and sisters. I hope we pray for each other as we live out in, in Grace and Truth Church, Cincinnati. Let's make Christ our sure and steady anchor, his truth, our sure and steady anchor so that nobody among us, and let's pray about this, would make shipwreck of their lives. We obediently fight the good fight when gospel integrity is our life. Let's pray. Lord, we, we see the truth and the reality of your word. We see that the reality that there is only one way of salvation, one way of being reconciled with you, and it's through the cross. It's through you, Christ. Our Lord, our Messiah, our, our King, our Saviour. And Lord Jesus, we ask that we would uphold your truth from Genesis to Revelation, that we would put you and glorify you and exalt you before everybody that we talk to so that, that all may know, Lord, all may know that you are the only way. Please help us. Please, Lord, in your power and in your mercy and grace, may we serve you obediently. And Lord, in your power and in your power alone, may your gospel be upheld as the truth that we stand on, as this fellowship of believers in you that you have brought together. And may we, Lord, glorify you as we tell others and that you save others with this only saving message that we can bring. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.